The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 2, by Will Durant. Copyright, 1935, by Will Durant. Copyright renewed, 1963, by Will Durant. This recording of the full-length reading of Our Oriental Heritage was published by arrangement with Monica Ariel Mehel, trustee Ethel B. Durant Trust, Monica Ariel Mehel, and William James Durant Easton, and was produced in 1994 by Books on Tape Incorporated, which holds the copyright thereto. Neither this recording, nor any part thereof, may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authority from Books on Tape Incorporated. This book is read by Alexander Adams. The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 2, by Will Durant. This book consists of 15 chapters and is 461 pages long. Chapter 17, The Life of the People. 1. The Makers of Wealth, The Jungle Background, Agriculture, mining, handicrafts, commerce, money, taxes, famines, poverty, and wealth. The soil of India had not lent itself willingly to civilization. A great part of it was jungle, the jealously guarded home of lions, tigers, elephants, serpents, and other individualists with the Rousseauian contempt for civilization. The biological struggle to free the land from these enemies had continued underneath all surface dramas of economic and political strife. Akbar shot tigers near Mathura and captured wild elephants in many places where none can be found today. In Vedic times, the lion might be met with anywhere in northwest or central India. Now it is almost extinct throughout the peninsula. The serpent and the insect, however, still carry on the war. In 1926, some 2,000 Hindus were killed by wild animals, 875 by marauding tigers, but 20,000 Hindus met death from the fangs of snakes. Gradually, as the soil was redeemed from the beast, it was turned to the cultivation of rice, pulse, millet, vegetables, and fruits. Through the greater part of Indian history, the majority of the population have lived abstemiously on these natural foods, reserving flesh, fish, and fowl for the outcasts and the rich. To render their diet more exciting, and perhaps to assist Aphrodite, the Hindus have grown and consumed an unusual abundance of curry, ginger, cloves, cinnamon, and other spices. Europeans valued these spices so highly that they stumbled upon a hemisphere in search for them. Who knows but that America was discovered for the sake of love. In Vedic times, the land belonged to the people, but from the days of Chandragupta Maria, it became the habit of the kings to claim royal ownership of all the soil and to let it out to the tiller for an annual rental and tax. Irrigation was usually a governmental undertaking. One of the dams raised by Chandragupta functioned till 150 A.D. Remains of the ancient canals can be seen everywhere today, and signs still survive of the artificial lake that Raj Singh, Rajput Rana of Mewar, built as an irrigation reservoir in 1661 and which he surrounded with a marble wall twelve miles in length. The Hindus seem to have been the first people to mine gold. Herodotus and Megasthenes tell of the great gold-digging ants, in size somewhat less than dogs but bigger than foxes, which helped the miners to find the metal by turning it up in their scratching of the sand. We do not know what these ants were. They were more probably ant-eaters than ants. Much of the gold used in the Persian Empire in the 5th century before Christ came from India. Silver, copper, lead, tin, zinc, and iron were also mined, iron as early as 1500 B.C. The art of tempering and casting iron developed in India long before its known appearance in Europe. Vikramaditya, for example, erected at Delhi in circa 380 A.D. an iron pillar that stands untarnished today after 15 centuries and the quality of metal, or manner of treatment, which has preserved it from rust or decay, is still a mystery to modern metallurgical science. Before the European invasion, the smelting of iron in small charcoal furnaces was one of the major industries of India. The Industrial Revolution taught Europe how to carry out these processes more cheaply, on a larger scale, and the Indian industry died under the competition. 
Only in our own time are the rich mineral resources of India being again exploited and explored. The growing of cotton appears earlier in India than elsewhere. Apparently it was used for cloth in Mahenjo-daro. In our oldest classical reference to cotton, Herodotus says with pleasing ignorance, Certain wild trees there bear wool instead of fruit, which in beauty and quality excels that of sheep, and the Indians make their clothing from these trees. It was their wars in the Near East that acquainted the Romans with this tree-grown wool. Arabian travelers in ninth century India reported that in this country they make garments of such extraordinary perfection that nowhere else is their like to be seen. Sewed and woven to such a degree of fineness they may be drawn through a ring of moderate size. The medieval Arabs took over the art from India, and their word kutan gave us our word cotton. The name muslin was originally applied to fine cotton weaves made in Mosul from Indian models. Calico was so called because it came first in 1631 from Calicut on the southwestern shores of India. Embroidery, says Marco Polo, speaking of Gujarat in 1293 A.D., is here performed with more delicacy than in any other part of the world. The shawls of Kashmir and the rugs of India bear witness even today to the excellence of Indian weaving in texture and design. But weaving was only one of the many handicrafts of India, and the weavers were only one of the many craft and merchant guilds that organized and regulated the industry of India. Europe looked upon the Hindus as experts in almost every line of manufacture. Woodwork, ivory work, metalwork, bleaching, dyeing, tanning, soap making, glass blowing, gunpowder, fireworks, cement, etc. China imported eyeglasses from India in 1260 A.D. Bernier, traveling in India in the 17th century, described it as humming with industry. Fitch, in 1585, saw a fleet of 180 boats carrying a great variety of goods down the river Jumna. Internal trade flourished. Every roadside was and is a bazaar. The foreign trade of India is as old as her history. Objects found in Sumeria and Egypt indicate a traffic between these countries and India as far back as 3000 B.C. Commerce between India and Babylon by the Persian Gulf flourished from 700 to 480 B.C. And perhaps the Ivory apes and peacocks of Solomon came by the same route from the same source. India's ships sailed the sea to Burma and China in Chandragupta's days, and Greek merchants called Yavana, Ionians by the Hindus, thronged the markets of Dravidian India in the centuries before and after the birth of Christ. Rome in her Epicurean days depended upon India for spices, perfumes, and unguents, and paid great prices for Indian silks, brocades, muslins, and cloth of gold. Pliny condemned the extravagance which sent five million dollars yearly from Rome to India for such luxuries. Indian cheetahs, tigers, and elephants assisted in the gladiatorial games and sacrificial rites of the Colosseum. The Parthian wars were fought by Rome largely to keep open the trade route to India. In the seventh century the Arabs captured Persia and Egypt, and thereafter trade between Europe and Asia passed through Moslem hands, hence the Crusades, and Columbus. Under the Mughals, foreign commerce rose again. The wealth of Venice, Genoa, and other Italian cities grew through their service as ports for European trade with India and the East. The Renaissance owed more to the wealth derived from this trade than to the manuscripts brought to Italy by the Greeks. Akbar had an admiralty which supervised the building of ships and the regulation of ocean traffic. The ports of Bengal and Sindh were famous for shipbuilding, and did their work so well that the Sultan of Constantinople found it cheaper to have his vessels built there than in Alexandria. Even the East India Company had many of its ships built in Bengal docks. The development of coinage to facilitate this trade took many centuries. In Buddha's days, rough rectangular coins were issued by various economic and political authorities, but it was not until the fourth century before Christ that India, under the influence of Persia and Greece, arrived at a coinage guaranteed by the state. Sher Shah issued well-designed pieces of copper, silver, and gold, and established the rupee as the basic coin of the realm. Under Akbar and Jehangir, the coinage of India was superior in artistic execution and purity of metal to that of any modern European state. As in medieval Europe, so in medieval India the growth of industry and commerce was impeded by a religious antipathy to the taking of interest. 
The Indians, says Megasthenes, neither put out money at usury, interest, nor know how to borrow. It is contrary to established usage for an Indian either to do or to suffer wrong, and therefore they neither make contracts nor require securities. When the Hindu could not invest his savings in his own economic enterprises, he preferred to hide them, or to buy jewelry as conveniently hoardable wealth. Perhaps this failure to develop a facile credit system aided the Industrial Revolution to establish the European domination of Asia. Slowly, however, despite the hostility of the Brahmins, money lending grew. The rates varied according to the caste of the borrower from 12 to 60 percent, usually ranging about 20. Bankruptcy was not permitted as a liquidation of debts. If a debtor died insolvent, his descendants to the sixth generation continued to be responsible for his obligations. Both agriculture and trade were heavily taxed to support the government. The peasant had to surrender from one-sixth to one-half of his crop, and as in medieval and contemporary Europe, many tolls were laid upon the flow and exchange of goods. Akbar raised the land tax to one-third, but abolished all other exactions. The land tax was a bitter levy, but it had the saving grace of rising with prosperity and falling with depression, and in famine years the poor could at least die untaxed. For famines occurred even in Akbar's palmy days. That of 1556 seems to have led to cannibalism and widespread desolation. Roads were bad, transportation was slow, and the surplus of one region could with difficulty be used to supply the dearth of another. As everywhere, there were extremes of poverty and wealth, but hardly so great as in India or America today. At the bottom was a small minority of slaves. Above them, the Shudras were not so much slaves as hired men, though their status, like that of almost all Hindus, was hereditary. The poverty described by Père Dubois, 1820, was the result of fifty years of political chaos. Under the Mughals, the condition of the people had been relatively prosperous. Wages were modest, ranging for manual workers from three to nine cents a day in Akbar's reign, but prices were correspondingly low. In 1600, a rupee, normally 32 and a half cents, bought 194 pounds of wheat, or 278 pounds of barley. In 1901, it bought only 29 pounds of wheat, or 44 pounds of barley. An Englishman resident in India in 1616 described the plenty of all provisions as very great throughout the whole monarchy, and added that everyone there may eat bread without scarceness. Another Englishman, touring India in the 17th century, found that his expenses averaged four cents a day. The wealth of the country reached its two peaks under Chandragupta Maurya and Shah Jahan. The riches of India under the Gupta kings became a proverb throughout the world. Yuan Chuang pictured an Indian city as beautified with gardens and pools, and adorned with institutes of letters and arts. The inhabitants were well off, and there were families with great wealth. Fruit and flowers were abundant. The people had a refined appearance and dressed in glossy silk attire. They were clear and suggestive in discourse. They were equally divided between orthodoxy and heterodoxy. The Hindu kingdoms overthrown by the Moslems, says Elphinstone, were so wealthy that the historians tire of telling of the immense loot of jewels and coin captured by the invaders. Niccolo Conti described the banks of the Ganges, circa 1420, as lined with one prosperous city after another, each well-designed, rich in gardens and orchards, silver and gold, commerce and industry. Shah Jahan's treasury was so full that he kept two underground strong rooms, each of some 150,000 cubic feet capacity, almost filled with silver and gold. Contemporary testimonies, says Vincent Smith, permit of no doubt that the urban population of the more important cities was well to do. Travelers described Agra and Fatpur Sikri as each greater and richer than London. Anctil du Perron, journeying through the Maratha districts in 1760, found himself in the midst of the simplicity and happiness of the Golden Age. The people were cheerful, vigorous, and in high health. Clive, visiting Murshidabad in 1759, reckoned that ancient capital of Bengal as equal in extent population and wealth to the London of his time, with palaces far greater than those of Europe, and men richer than any individual in London. India, said Clive, was a country of inexhaustible riches. Tried by Parliament for helping himself too readily to this wealth, Clive excused himself ingeniously. 
he described the riches that he had found about him in India, opulent cities ready to offer him any bribe to escape indiscriminate plunder, bankers throwing open to his grasp vaults piled high with jewels and gold. He concluded, At this moment I stand astonished at my own moderation. 2. The Organization of Society The Monarchy, Law, the Code of Manu, Development of the Caste System, Rise of the Brahmins, Their Privileges and Powers, Their Obligations, in Defense of Caste. Because the roads were poor and communication difficult, it was easier to conquer than to rule India. Its topography ordained that this semi-continent would remain until the coming of railways, a medley of divided states. Under such conditions, a government could have security only through a competent army, and as the army required in frequent crises a dictatorial leader immune to political eloquence, the form of government which developed in India was naturally monarchical. The people enjoyed a considerable measure of liberty under the native dynasties, partly through the autonomous communities in the villages and the trade guilds in the towns, and partly through the limitations that the Brahmin aristocracy placed upon the authority of the king. The laws of Manu, though they were more a code of ethics than a system of practiced legislation, expressed the focal ideas of India about monarchy, that it should be impartially rigorous and paternally solicitous of the public good. The Mohammedan rulers paid less attention than their Hindu predecessors to these ideals and checks. They were a conquering minority and rested their rule frankly on the superiority of their guns. The army, says a Muslim historian with charming clarity, is the source and means of government. Akbar was an exception, for he relied chiefly upon the goodwill of a people prospering under his mild and benevolent despotism. Perhaps in the circumstances his was the best government possible. Its vital defect, as we have seen, lay in its dependence upon the character of the king. The supreme centralized authority that proved beneficent under Akbar proved ruinous under Aurangzeb. Having been raised up by violence, the Afghan and Mughal rulers were always subject to recall by assassination and wars of succession were almost as expensive, though not as disturbing to economic life, as a modern election. Under the Moslems, law was merely the will of the emperor or sultan. Under the Hindu kings, it was a confused mixture of royal commands, village traditions, and caste rules. Judgment was given by the head of the family, the head of the village, the headmen of the caste, the court of the guild, the governor of the province, the minister of the king, or the king himself. Litigation was brief, judgment swift. Lawyers came only with the British. Torture was used under every dynasty until abolished by Firoz Shah. Death was the penalty for any of a great variety of crimes, such as housebreaking, damage to royal property, or theft on a scale that would now make a man a very pillar of society. Punishments were cruel, including amputation of hands, feet, nose, or ears, tearing out of eyes, pouring molten lead into the throat, crushing the bones of hands and feet with a mallet, burning the body with fire, driving nails into the hands, feet, or bosom, cutting the sinews, sawing men asunder, quartering them, impaling them, roasting them alive, letting them be trampled to death by elephants, or giving them to wild and hungry dogs. No code of laws applied to all India. In the ordinary affairs of life, the place of law was taken by the Dharma Shastras, Metrical textbooks of caste regulations and duties composed by the Brahmins from a strictly Brahmin point of view. The oldest of these is the so-called Code of Manu. Manu was the mythical ancestor of the Manava tribe, or school, of Brahmins near Delhi. He was represented as the son of a god and as receiving his laws from Brahma himself. This code of 2,685 verses, once assigned to 1200 B.C., is now referred vaguely to the first centuries of our era. Originally intended as a handbook or guide to proper caste behavior for these Manava Brahmins, it was gradually accepted as a code of conduct by the entire Hindu community, and though never recognized by the Moslem kings, it acquired, within the caste system, all the force of law. Its character will appear to some extent in the course of the following analysis of Hindu society and morals. In general, it was marked by a superstitious acceptance of trial by ordeal, a severe application of the lex talionis, and an untiring inculcation of the virtues, rights, and powers of the Brahmin caste. Its effect was to strengthen enormously the hold of the caste system upon Hindu society. 
This system had grown more rigid and complex since the Vedic period, not only because it is in the nature of institutions to become stiff with age, but because the instability of the political order and the overrunning of India by alien peoples and creeds had intensified caste as a barrier to the mixture of Muslim and Hindu blood. In Vedic days, caste had been varna, or color. In medieval India, it became jati, or birth. Its essence was twofold, the heredity of status and the acceptance of dharma, that is, the traditional duties and employments of one's native caste. The head and chief beneficiaries of the system were the eight million males of the Brahmin caste. Weakened for a while by the rise of Buddhism under Ashoka, the Brahmins, with that patient tenacity which characterizes priesthoods, had bided their time and had recaptured power and leadership under the Gupta line. From the second century A.D. we find records of great gifts, usually of land, to the Brahmin caste. These grants, like all Brahmin property, were exempt from taxation until the British came. The Code of Manu warns the king never to tax a Brahmin, even when all other sources of revenue have failed. For a Brahmin provoked to anger can instantly destroy the king and all his army by reciting curses and mystical texts. It was not the custom of Hindus to make wills, since their traditions required that the property of the family should be held in common and automatically descend from the dying to the surviving males. But when, under the influence of European individualism, wills were introduced, they were greatly favored by the Brahmins as an occasional means of securing property for ecclesiastical purposes. The most important element in any sacrifice to the gods was the fee paid to the ministrant priest. The highest summit of piety was largesse in such fees. Miracles and a thousand superstitions were another fertile source of sacerdotal wealth. For a consideration, a Brahmin might render a barren woman fecund. Oracles were manipulated for financial ends. Men were engaged to feign madness and to confess that their fate was a punishment for parsimony to the priests. In every illness, lawsuit, bad omen, unpleasant dream, or new enterprise, the advice of a Brahmin was desirable, and the adviser was worthy of his hire. The power of the Brahmins was based upon a monopoly of knowledge. They were the custodians and remakers of tradition, the educators of children, the composers or editors of literature, the experts versed in the inspired and infallible Vedas. If a Shudra listened to the reading of the scriptures, his ears, according to the Brahminical law books, were to be filled with molten lead. If he recited it, his tongue was to be split. If he committed it to memory, he was to be cut in two. Such were the threats, seldom enforced, with which the priests guarded their wisdom. Brahminism thus became an exclusive cult, carefully hedged around against all vulgar participation. According to the Code of Manu, a Brahmin was by divine right at the head of all creatures. He did not, however, share in all the powers and privileges of the order until, after many years of preparation, he was made twice born, or regenerate, by solemn investiture with the triple cord. From that moment he became a holy being. His person and property were inviolate. Indeed, according to Manu, all that exists in this universe is the Brahmin's property. Brahmins were to be maintained by public and private gifts, not as charity, but as a sacred obligation. Hospitality to a Brahmin was one of the highest religious duties, and a Brahmin not hospitably received could walk away with all the accumulated merits of the householder's good deeds. Even if a Brahmin committed every crime, he was not to be killed. The king might exile him, but must allow him to keep his property. He who tried to strike a Brahmin would suffer in hell for a hundred years. He who actually struck a Brahmin would suffer in hell for a thousand years. If a Shudra debauched the wife of a Brahmin, the Shudra's property was to be confiscated, and his genitals were to be cut off. A Shudra who killed a Shudra might atone for his crime by giving ten cows to the Brahmins. If he killed a Vaishya, he must give the Brahmins a hundred cows. If he killed a Kshatriya, he must give the Brahmins a thousand cows. If he killed a Brahmin, he must die. Only the murder of a Brahmin was really murder. The functions and obligations that corresponded to these privileges were numerous and burdensome. The Brahmin not only acted as priest, but trained himself for the clerical, pedagogical, and literary professions. He was required to study law and learn the Vedas. Every other duty was subordinate to this. Even to repeat the Vedas entitled the Brahmin to beatitude, regardless of rites or works. And if he memorized the Rig Veda, he might destroy the world without incurring any guilt. 
He must not marry outside his caste. If he married a Shudra, his children were to be pariahs. For, said Manu, the man who is good by birth becomes low by low associations, but the man who is low by birth cannot become high by high associations. The Brahmin had to bathe every day and again after being shaved by a barber of low caste. He had to purify with cow dung the place where he intended to sleep, and he had to follow a strict hygienic ritual in attending to the duties of nature. He was to abstain from all animal food, including eggs, and from onions, garlic, mushrooms, and leeks. He was to drink nothing but water, and it must have been drawn and carried by a Brahmin. He was to abstain from unguents, perfumes, sensual pleasure, covetousness, and wrath. If he touched an unclean thing or the person of any foreigner, even the governor-general of India, he was to purify himself by ceremonial ablutions. If he committed a crime, he had to accept a heavier punishment than would fall upon a lower caste. If, for example, a shudra stole, he was to be fined eightfold the sum or value of his theft. If a vaishya stole, he was to be fined sixteenfold. A kshatriya, thirty-twofold. A brahman, sixty-fourfold. The Brahmin was never to injure any living thing. Given a moderate observation of these rules, and a people too burdened with the tillage of the fields, and therefore too subject to the apparently personal whims of the elements, to rise out of superstition to education, the power of the priests grew from generation to generation, and made them the most enduring aristocracy in history. Nowhere else can we find this astonishing phenomenon, so typical of the slow rate of change in India, of an upper class maintaining its ascendancy and privileges through all conquests, dynasties, and governments for twenty-five hundred years. Only the outcast Chandalas can rival them in perpetuity. The ancient Kshatriyas, who had dominated the intellectual as well as the political field in the days of Buddha, disappeared after the Gupta age. And though the Brahmins recognized the Rajput warriors as the later equivalent of the old fighting caste, the Kshatriyas, after the fall of Rajputana, soon became extinct. At last only two great divisions remained. The Brahmins, as the social and mental rulers of India, and beneath them three thousand castes that were in reality industrial guilds. Much can be said in defense of what, after monogamy, must be the most abused of all social institutions. The caste system had the eugenic value of keeping the presumably finer strains from dilution and disappearance through indiscriminate mixture. It established certain habits of diet and cleanliness as a rule of honor which all might observe and emulate. It gave order to the chaotic inequalities and differences of men, and spared the soul the modern fever of climbing and gain. It gave order to every life by prescribing for each man a dharma, or code of conduct for his caste. It gave order to every trade and profession, elevated every occupation into a vocation not likely to be changed, and by making every industry a caste, provided its members with a means of united action against exploitation and tyranny. It offered an escape from the plutocracy or the military dictatorship, which are apparently the only alternatives to aristocracy. It gave to a country shorn of political stability by a hundred invasions and revolutions, a social, moral, and cultural order and continuity rivaled only by the Chinese. Amid a hundred anarchic changes in the state, the Brahmins maintained, through the system of caste, a stable society and preserved, augmented, and transmitted civilization. The nation bore with them patiently, even proudly, because everyone knew that in the end they were the one indispensable government of India. 3. Morals and Marriage Dharma, children, child marriage, the art of love, prostitution, romantic love, marriage, the family, woman, her intellectual life, her rights, Perda, Sati, the widow. When the caste system dies, the moral life of India will undergo a long transition of disorder, for there the moral code has been bound up almost inseparably with caste. Morality was Dharma, the rule of life for each man as determined by his caste. To be a Hindu meant not so much to accept a creed as to take a place in the caste system and to accept the dharma or duties attaching to that place by ancient tradition and regulation. Each post had its obligations, its limitations, and its rights. With them and within them the pious Hindu would lead his life, finding in them a certain contentment of routine, and never thinking of stepping into another caste. 
Better thine own work is, though done with fault, said the Bhagavad Gita, than doing others' work, even excellently. Dharma is to the individual what its normal development is to a seed, the orderly fulfillment of an inherent nature and destiny. So old is this conception of morality that even today it is difficult for all and impossible for most Hindus to think of themselves except as members of a specific caste, guided and bound by its rule. Without caste, says an English historian, Hindu society is inconceivable. In addition to the dharma of each caste, the Hindu recognized a general dharma or obligation affecting all castes and embracing chiefly respect for Brahmins and reverence for cows. Next to these duties was that of bearing children. Then only is a man a perfect man, says Manu's Code, when he is three, himself, his wife, and his son. Not only would children be economic assets to their parents and support them as a matter of course in old age, but they would carry on the household worship of their ancestors and would offer to them periodically the food without which these ghosts would starve. Consequently, there was no birth control in India, and abortion was branded as a crime equal to the murder of a Brahmin. Infanticide occurred, but it was exceptional. The father was glad to have children and proud to have many. The tenderness of the old to the young is one of the fairest aspects of Hindu civilization. The child was hardly born when the parents began to think of its marriage. For marriage in the Hindu system was compulsory. An unmarried man was an outcast, without social status or consideration, and prolonged virginity was a disgrace. Nor was marriage to be left to the whim of individual choice or romantic love. It was a vital concern of society and the race, and could not safely be trusted to the myopia of passion or the accidents of proximity. It must be arranged by the parents before the fever of sex should have time to precipitate a union doomed, in the Hindu view, to disillusionment and bitterness. Manu gave the name of Gandharva marriage to unions by mutual choice and stigmatized them as born of desire. They were permissible but hardly respectable. The early maturity of the Hindu, making a girl of twelve as old as a girl of fourteen or fifteen in America, created a difficult problem of moral and social order. It should be added that Gandhi denies that this precocity has any physical basis. I loathe and detest child marriage, he writes. I shudder to see a child widow. I have never known a grosser superstition than that the Indian climate causes sexual precocity. What does bring about untimely puberty is the mental and moral atmosphere surrounding family life. Should marriage be arranged to coincide with sexual maturity, or should it be postponed, as in America, until the male arrives at economic maturity? The first solution apparently weakens the national physique, unduly accelerates the growth of population, and sacrifices the woman almost completely to reproduction. The second solution leaves the problems of unnatural delay, sexual frustration, prostitution, and venereal disease. The Hindus chose child marriage as the lesser evil, and tried to mitigate its dangers by establishing, between the marriage and its consummation, a period in which the bride should remain with her parents until the coming of puberty. The institution was old and therefore holy. It had been rooted in the desire to prevent intercaste marriage through casual sexual attraction. It was later encouraged by the fact that the conquering and otherwise ruthless Moslems were restrained by their religion from carrying away married women as slaves. And finally it took rigid form in the parental resolve to protect the girl from the erotic sensibilities of the male. That these were reasonably keen, and that the male might be trusted to attend to his biological functions on the slightest provocation, appears from the Hindu literature of love. The Kama Sutra, or Doctrine of Desire, is the most famous in a long list of works revealing a certain preoccupation with the physical and mental technique of sex. It was composed, the author assures us, according to the precepts of Holy Writ, for the benefit of the world, by Vatsyayana while leading the life of a religious student at Benares and wholly engaged in the contemplation of the deity. He who neglects a girl, thinking she is too bashful, says this anchorite, is despised by her as a beast ignorant of the working of the female mind. Vatsyayana gives a delightful picture of a girl in love, but his wisdom is lavished chiefly upon the parental art of getting her married away and the husbandly art of keeping her physically content. We must not presume that the sexual sensitivity of the Hindu led to any unusual license. Child marriage raised a barrier against premarital relations, and the strong religious sanctions used in the inculcation of wifely fidelity made adultery far more difficult and rare than in Europe or America. 
prostitution was for the most part confined to the temples. In the south, the needs of the Assyrian male were met by the providential institution of devadasis, literally servants of the gods, actually prostitutes. Each Tamil temple had a troop of sacred women engaged at first to dance and sing before the idols, and perhaps to entertain the Brahmins. Some of them seemed to have lived lives of almost conventual seclusion. Others were allowed to extend their services to all who could pay, on condition that a part of their earnings should be contributed to the clergy. Many of these temple courtesans, or notch girls, provided dancing and singing in public functions and private gatherings in the style of the geishas of Japan. Some of them learned to read and, like the hetairai of Greece, furnished cultured conversation in homes where the married women were neither encouraged to read nor allowed to mingle with the guests. In 1004 AD, as a sacred inscription informs us, the temple of the Chola king Rajaraja Tanjore had 400 devadasis. The custom acquired the sanctity of time, and no one seems to have considered it immoral. Respectable women now and then dedicated a daughter to the profession of temple prostitute in much the same spirit in which a son might be dedicated to the priesthood. Dubois, at the beginning of the 19th century, described the temples of the South as in some cases converted into mere brothels. The devadasis, whatever their original functions, were frankly called harlots by the public and were used as such. If we may believe the old abbe, who had no reason to be prejudiced in favor of India, their official duties consist in dancing and singing within the temples twice a day, and also at all public ceremonies. The first they execute with sufficient grace, although their attitudes are lascivious and their gestures indecorous. As regards their singing, it is almost always confined to obscene verses describing some licentious episode in the history of their gods. Under these circumstances of temple prostitution and child marriage, little opportunity was given for what we call romantic love. This idealistic devotion of one sex to the other appears in Indian literature, for example in the poems of Chandidas and Jayadeva, but usually as a symbol of the soul surrendering to God while in actual life it took most often the form of a complete devotion of the wife to her mate. The love poetry is sometimes of the ethereal type depicted by the Tennysons and Longfellows of our Puritan tradition. Sometimes it is the full-bodied and sensuous passion of the Elizabethan stage. One writer unites religion and love and sees in either ecstasy a recognition of identity. Another lists the 360 different emotions that fill the lover's heart and counts the patterns which his teeth have left on his beloved's flesh, or shows him decorating her breasts with painted flowers of sandal paste. And the author of the Nala and Damayanti episode in the Mahabharata describes the melancholy sighs and pale dyspepsia of the lovers in the best style of the French troubadours. Such whimsical passions were seldom permitted to determine marriage in India. Manu allowed eight different forms of marriage, in which marriage by capture and marriage from affection were ranked lowest in the moral scale and marriage by purchase was accepted as the sensible way of arranging a union. In the long run, the Hindu legislator thought, those marriages are most soundly based that rest upon an economic foundation. In the days of Dubois, to marry and to buy a wife were synonymous expressions in India. The wisest marriage was held to be one arranged by the parents with full regard for the rules of endogamy and exogamy. The youth must marry within his caste and outside his gotra, or group. He might take several wives, but only one of his own caste, who was to have precedence over the rest. Preferably, said Manu, he was to be monogamous. The woman was to love her husband with patient devotion. The husband was to give his wife not romantic affection, but solicitous protection. The Hindu family was typically patriarchal, with the father full master of his wife, his children, and his slaves. Woman was a lovely but inferior being. In the beginning, says Hindu legend, when Twastri, the divine artificer, came to the creation of woman, he found that he had exhausted his materials in the making of man, and had no solid elements left. In this dilemma he fashioned her eclectically out of the odds and ends of creation. He took the rotundity of the moon and the curves of the creepers, the clinging of tendrils and the trembling of grass, and the slenderness of the reed and the bloom of flowers, and the lightness of leaves, and the tapering of the elephant's trunk and the glances of deer, and the clustering of rows of bees, and the joyous gaiety of sunbeams, and the weeping of clouds, and the fickleness of the winds, and the timidity of the hare, and the vanity of the peacock, and the softness of the parrot's bosom, and the hardness of adamant, and the sweetness of honey, and the cruelty of the tiger, 
and the warm glow of fire and the coldness of snow and the chattering of jays and the cooing of the kokila and the hypocrisy of the crane and the fidelity of the chakravaka and compounding all these together he made woman and gave her to man. Nevertheless, despite all this equipment, woman fared poorly in India. Her high status in Vedic days was lost under priestly influence and Mohammedan example. The code of Manu set the tone against her in phrases reminiscent of an early stage in Christian theology. The source of dishonor is woman, the source of strife is woman, the source of earthly existence is woman, therefore avoid woman. A female, says another passage, is able to draw from the right path in this life not a fool only but even a sage, and can lead him in subjection to desire or to wrath. The law laid it down that all through her life woman should be in tutelage, first to her father, then to her husband, and finally to her son. The wife addressed her husband humbly as Master, Lord, even as my God. In public she walked some distance behind him and seldom received a word from him. She was expected to show her devotion by the most minute service, preparing the meals, eating, after they had finished, the food left by her husband and her sons, and embracing her husband's feet at bedtime. A faithful wife, said Manu, must serve her lord as if he were a god, and never do aught to pain him, whatsoever be his state, and even though devoid of every virtue. A wife who disobeyed her husband would become a jackal in her next incarnation. Like her sisters in Europe and America before our own times, the women of India received education only if they were ladies of high degree or temple prostitutes. The art of reading was considered inappropriate in a woman. Her power over men could not be increased by it, and her attractiveness would be diminished. Says Chitra in Tagore's play, When a woman is merely a woman, when she winds herself round and round men's hearts with her smiles and sobs and services and caressing endearments, then she is happy. Of what use to her? our learning and great achievements. Knowledge of the Vedas was denied to her. For a woman to study the Vedas, says the Mahabharata, is a sign of confusion in the realm. Megasthenes reported in Chandragupta's days that the Brahmins keep their wives, and they have many wives, ignorant of all philosophy. For if women learned to look upon pleasure and pain, life and death, philosophically, they would become depraved, or else no longer remain in subjection. In the Code of Manu, three persons were ineligible to hold property, a wife, a son, and a slave. Whatever these might earn became the property of their master. A wife, however, could retain as her own the dowry and gifts that she received at her nuptials, and the mother of a prince might govern in his stead during his minority. The husband could divorce his wife for unchastity. The woman could not divorce her husband for any cause. A wife who drank liquor, or was deceased, or rebellious, or wasteful, or quarrelsome, might at any time be not divorced, but superseded by another wife. Passages of the Code advocate an enlightened gentleness to women. They are not to be struck even with a flower. They are not to be watched too strictly, for then their subtlety will find a way to mischief. And if they like fine raiment, it is wise to indulge them, for if the wife be not elegantly attired, she will not exhilarate her husband whereas when a wife is gaily adorned, the whole house is embellished. Way must be made for a woman as for the aged or a priest, and pregnant women, brides and damsels, shall have food before all other guests. The woman could not rule as a wife, she might rule as a mother. The greatest tenderness and respect was paid to the mother of many children, and even the patriarchal code of Manu said, The mother exceedeth a thousand fathers in the right to reverence. Doubtless the influx of Islamic ideas had something to do with the decline in the status of woman in India after Vedic days. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.